So we're here at Embedded World 2019, and who are you? Hello, my name is Guillaume Nardi. I'm the VP of Business Development at Collabra, and this is... My name is Robert Foss, and I'm a graphics developer at Collabra. So what is uh, Collabra? Collabra is a, a global consultancy specializing exclusively in free and open source software development for our customers. Free and open source development consultancy? Yes. So you have lots of uh, uh, work? To do? We are quite busy and we have fantastic engineers around the world that are helping our customers adopt existing free projects or work on new projects for them or helping them take existing code internally and turn them into free software as well. So it's been keeping us really busy. And uh, let's check over here. Uh, we walk around. Uh, open source, you're talking about uh, open source Mali GPU driver, are you? Uh, this yeah. demo right here is running the very recent Panfos driver. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, it's it working. It's working, and uh, it's been available upstream in the open source repositories for about a month now. You're running on the RockPy. Exactly. This Rock is Pi running Four. RockPy Four, which is a Rockship SoC. And um, made by our friends at Raksa, which is a yeah. really nice house. And this is one of our favorite SBC boards available today. This is a three three nine nine. Exactly. And this form factor right here with dual USB 3, USB 2, and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, so so have, uh, have you at Collabora been working on the Pantrust GPU driver? So we've been part of the graphics community in free software for a really long time, going back to x11, x.org, and all of the iterations before that, embracing the Welland specification when it first started and continuing beyond that. The movement started with Fridrino and the Vivente drivers, the Naviv, etc., made it natural that eventually there will be a Mali GPU driver in free software as well. Robert and the rest of the team have been involved in this initiative for quite some time. And as Robert just said, about a month ago, early January 2019, uh, the, the user space portion landed in Mesa, and uh, Robert and, and others in our team have been involved in that. We cannot take all the credits. It's very much a community effort. There's been people out there doing great work on all of those free software GPU drivers. Uh, the Panfrost driver is just the latest iteration of that. So uh, how much have you been doing with the Panfrost? So we've got a developer working 50% of his time, I believe, okay. and uh, uh, that that is like a third or a fourth of the total amount, total amount of developer hours that is going, being poured into the Pampas project at this time. So what, uh, what, what is it specifically you've been doing? Uh, are trying to get it to the same level as Fridrino, or is it how far exactly. is it so far? So getting it to the level of Fridrino yeah. is definitely uh, the goal. The Fridrino driver is very stable and mature by now, but there's that's a long way, and we've only started taking the first steps here. Uh, as you can see, it works, but this is a very simple demo, uh, but we want it to be performant and compliant. So how far is a long way in like open source world? Well, if we look at uh, some... Stuff happens fast sometimes? Exactly. There's a range. So uh, it can take anything between like uh, like seven years to, to something m much more reasonable, like uh, uh, four years or two years. How about six months? Impossible. Um, How about if somebody comes and invests like a whole bunch of engineers to help or it really something? really depends on what you want to do with it. If you want to have like a limited sort of uh, um, support for some, your specific application, something is doable very quickly. But if you want broad support for every feature out there, it's going to take a, long, uh, a bit longer time. So maybe in two years you think we could, it could be very smooth, uh, hardware accelerated GPU, I think Linux that's a, uh, OS on, on Mali? Devices? I think that's a very reasonable timeline. Give it two years, and this will be a very different story. Very, very smooth. How smooth is it now? It looks like the cube is moving fine. Yeah, this so is what 60 more do you need? FPS for sure, but this is a very simple demo. Uh, this is what we use for development in house. If this works, it means that we haven't done anything, anything terrible, basically. So it's the lowest possible form of threshold. I, I think that the barrier of complexity has gone down quite a bit as well. The quality of the subsystems that those drivers need to support have evolved a lot from the original drivers that try to do a free GPU. So whether it's at the Mesa layer or the kernel layer, all of that has improved quite a lot. It's better than Lima. Well, Lima was struggling from the fact that all of the underlying APIs were a lot more complex, and they had a very complex kernel space that they couldn't really work on. This is a very different beast that 
now has access to simpler kernel layer uh, efforts, etc. I think one of the demos on the other side, which is not running right now, uh, is showing video integration to those interfaces as well. So that's one of the next progression effort of, of making these drivers useful, is to be able to render video and different type of content as well. Is it the and Samsung Chromebook Glass? Yes, so which is the uh, uh, RX... Same SOC. Can you turn it on? Is I think it's going to start up. So it is turning on right now. Is it's this? just uh, started uh, one second ago. So it's uh, it's going to go through a complete recycling process, reflashing itself, so booting over the network. Um, this is a demo that's showcasing our continuous integration workflow, uh, leveraging some existing free software, of course. We're using Jenkins, we're using Lava, and some of the other tooling from Linaro. Uh, we're big, uh, very much involved in the kernel CI effort. And in these particular demonstrations we have here is we're showing a Odroid XU3 Exonos board, as well as a Samsung Chromebook Plus based on the Rockchip 3399 CPUs, basically cycling through tests that Guillaume over here has developed for us. And Guillaume is one of the lead developers in our uh, core group that focuses on automation. Test automation, yeah. So I've been using the Samsung Chromebook Plus, my main laptop, for 18 months. Uh, do you use it also? Uh, I don't use this particular model, but I have the older version, the LK3288 uh, based one. As a and uh, laptop, yeah. so, what are you actually doing there? What, what is you you booting all kinds of different kinds of Linux on it, or? Yeah, um, we mostly use it as part of kernel CI, so to, to um, boot um, mainline kernels, so upstream kernels from mainline and stable and Linux next. Um, so to boot it and do some tests like uh, V4L2 compliance, you know, the video for Linux compliance tests. So we're uh, here, yeah, what's going on here? Uh, it's running with can a pan, you, pan yeah. frost. So like the other uh, thing you showed a bit earlier, this is running with a pan frost free software. I use a space driver for a Mali GPU. Um, so that's just a spinning cube. Um, so you have pan units. frost is smooth on this, the same. I mean, it's the same as over there, but yeah, this, this is, is a different device with a different. Uh, it's a very high resolution as, screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, 2400 times 1600, I think. So um, and. Uh, there is it the same rock chip or what? What uh, does what they do? Exynos. Uh, it's a Samsung Exynos yeah. 5422. Yeah. It's yeah. an older chip. Yeah. And uh, do you have lots of stuff going with this too? Uh, on this one, so we've been running the IGT IGT test suite um, automatically, and that's also something we do as part of kernel CI. Uh, that's you know to test the DRM KMS um, stack basically. So do you work on lots of ARM stuff. Uh, we've been involved with ARM for quite some time. We have been working with Intel as a customer as well and other uh, architectures. We're very much agnostic. We very much welcome the RISC-V uh, uh, group as well and all the efforts they're doing there as well. We think that's, that's really uh, an amazing opportunity for free software at large and then free hardware also. Now that this Chromebook has cycled through this uh, testing as well, you can see uh, an element of the demo that wasn't on the other one where this is the exact same pan frost driver running the MPV video player directly rendering to the screen as well. So you see a completely smooth 60 frames per second uh, MPEG-2 or H.264 video, I can't remember what so format, is, um, playing back on, on that Chromebook Plus. Is it Plus. Visual 2 or...? Uh, this is using the request API directly to the MPV interface on the on the RX3399. So smooth video playback. Oh, there is no hardware involved there whatsoever. It's it's completely decoded in the in the chip. Yeah. And uh, so, what kind of customers do you have that require all these things? That wanna want your support. Well, the this? ones that we can talk about publicly are, for example, the the Chromebook team at uh, Google has been a fantastic partner with which we've worked, enabling SOCs across a lot of the products that their OEMs are working on, and and we are very thankful to Google for progressing so much of the ARM SOC supports in Linux and the various libraries upstream because of their dedication to the Linux kernel and the work that's happened there. So on the ARM Chromebooks, you are required. Uh, we're. A part. I'm not going to pretend we're, we're a big and part. We're three, involved. Three, nine, nine Chromebooks, for example, or the previous one too. I don't know all of them off the top of my head, but I know that our team has been involved with the Google engineers to make sure that the best performance, the longest battery possible is achieved with what is generally considered a very small engineering team. And, and everything that Google has achieved there has been phenomenal, and they deserve all the credit. And uh, uh, so that's that's kind of an awesome kind of work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. like, uh, you, uh, and your, 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 how big is your team? 
Um, the company overall is a little over 100 employees. We're worldwide distributed in over 35 countries. We have one big office in Cambridge, England, where you know there are more Nobel prizes than anywhere else in the world. And we're also an office in Montreal, Canada, uh, because we love our Canadians and we love our guys in Quebec, despite what I might say in, behind closed doors. Um, and uh, yeah, the, <laughs> we have a very big team working on LibreOffice as well. So we're very proud of all the work that Collabora Productivity is doing on LibreOffice. And that's alone like 15 or 18 engineers um, that a lot of the people watching these might be using. So please know that the uh, Collabora Libre Office productivity team has been a big contributor to that. Uh, so a there, lot of the, there's a customer somewhere out there that wants more and more LibreOffice? Yeah, absolutely. So we have various uh, people that are adopting Collabora Online, which is a hosted or on-premise uh, online version of the Office Productivity Suite that really works uh, very well for, for transactional workers and people that have specific needs and known templates and environments for uh, document editing and spreadsheets. It's and like Google Docs, kind of? It is kind of for people that have very, very specific need that want to control the data that are sensitive about the deployment. So either uh, public offices, potentially military adopters or, or contractors that, that have very strong uh, ISO 27001 compliance requirements, for example, or things like that. Maybe EPA compliance in the US where they just can't put their documents somewhere on the cloud and just think that things are going to happen nicely. They need to control everything on premise, their hard drives, their storage, their network their files, their document suite. Maybe it runs on a NAS or it runs on some kind of server or something. Yeah, I mean, the, typically these customers are fairly large enterprises that have multiple servers serving up like hundreds, if not thousands, of desktop users. And uh, do you also do stuff with the multimedia? Yeah, here we do a few things around multimedia. I'm not very familiar with that part of the company, so I'll let Olivier take over. Hi, so, Hi, uh, so who are you? I'm Olivier Kreit. I lead the multimedia team at Collabra. And uh, so our, our team focuses largely on the hardware integration of multimedia technologies. So things like making video hardware decoders and encoders work with hardware and uh, doing things like zero copy from the capture to the encoder or from the decoder to the screen or from the decoder to the encoder for transcoding to a scaler, et cetera. All of these, integrating all these hardware blocks in a way that makes them useful. We also work a lot with streaming technologies so a lot of this video and audio end up being sent over the internet, and there's all kinds of formats and compatibility issues and uh, all these things that we help people uh, do. Uh, where we've been over the last 12 years, the largest contributor to GStreamer, and this is really a fantastic framework because it makes it really easy to uh, do um, hardware-enabled things because of its modular nature. But largest also, contributor. Yes, we've been over the last 12 years. And uh, lots of, the, a big part of the world is using GStreamer or what? Yes, so GStreamer is widely used in uh, a lot of consumer products that people don't know. For example, almost all LG and Samsung TVs, all the smart part is GStreamer. Uh, there are both major players in the in-flight entertainment business, so the little screen in front of you when you're in a flight, they have GStreamer in there. A lot of cameras, uh, security products, uh, a lot of the hardware bits that you see around around these shows uh, that have video in it use GStreamer to connect all the various bits of hardware. And how much of the V4L2 is related? So we, uh, one of my senior engineers, principal engineers, Nicolas Dufresne, he is the maintainer of the GStreamer V4L2 integration. And he's been working really hard with the kernel community to grow the V4L2 API to a point where uh, it is actually possible to write a user space that is the same across all different kinds of hardware. So we've been very uh, aggressive, I would say, in ensuring that the uh, kernel people write drivers that have the same API, whichever hardware there is, by refusing to put any hardware-specific hacks in GStreamer but only adhering to the standard API. And this, in the last maybe four years, three years even, there's been a huge progress there from the kernel people, in, especially in the codec space, and finally having um, a unified user space code instead of having to have a user space hacks for every hardware vendor. And the Kodi uh, people, they use all the stuff that you've done? So Kodi, they, they write their own for a lot of everything. Uh, they use V4L, but everything above it is, is really custom. They're uh, 
they're more in the traditional way of working, uh, where they were completely okay with doing hacks for every single hardware because they were, well, they're a product organization and their goal was really to get the product out and working instead of, uh, you know, trying to make the infrastructure work for everyone, which it's is really what we do It's really hardcore work to do video stuff, no? Well, it's engineering, right? It's just software. How hard can it be? That's what I, what I tell everyone. But it, it's like you need to optimize things and yes. try to reach a smooth playback yes. of a cer certain, yes. certain uh, what's it called? Sometimes it's like a little, a little bit of a challenge. To get yes, to absolutely. And so video is a strange beast because you have a target and it's very fixed target. So you want like your 60 frames per second. 59 is not okay, it's not unacceptable. If you go to 61, no one cares, right? You just have to reach that magic 60. So if your hardware is just on the limit, it's very, very challenging. You know, if your hardware can just do 60 or 60.5 and you have to get every single bit, and then next year's hardware can do like 70 and, no, and, and all of this hard work is pointless now because the hardware is super fast and you don't care anymore. Nice. Cool. So it's a... All right. So uh, thanks a lot. So what's next with Collaborate? Lots of different things? Yes, of course. Um, as I was about to say earlier, there's a lot of industrial customers that we can't mention that are using free software and, and open source software inside their products. And we're, we're part of the companies that are helping them make those and we're continuing to do that and it's keeping us busy. And we look forward to 2019. I think that the open GPU drivers, as you identified yourself, are, are great momentum and they're going to make a lot of things uh, really good for the entire industry. I think RISC V is a very attractive and very interesting perspective as well. The Linux Foundation just announced ELISA, which is a uh, effort around uh, more real-time support for the Linux kernel, etc. So I think there's a lot to look forward to in 2019 and beyond.